Welcome once again to Speak Easy with Paul F. Tompkins. I am still Paul F. Tompkins, my guest today. You will remember him from all the seasons of Scrubs. He can currently be seen on ground floor on TBS. Please say hello to the esteemed actor, John C. McGinley. John, hello. Cheers. Thank you for, for being here. Me. Cheers. It's a pleasure. Um, something I learned about you that I did not know, but when I heard this, it made perfect sense to me. That early on, before you were an actor, you wanted to be a sports journalist. Like your heroes were Howard Cosell, Marv Albert, people like that. Bob Costas. Bob Costas, absolutely. And I could, I, I could totally see that. I could totally see you doing that. Is that something that you still think about sometimes? I've gotten to exercise uh, those demons a couple of times, once in any given Sunday, and then right. even, even more uh, obsessively doing Red Barber in 42, mm -hmm. Jackie Robinson story. And so plunging into Red's story and his sound and that crazy cadence and syncopation that that was an amalgamation of, of three different regions that he lived in, mm -hmm. and such a hard code to crack uh, audibly, mm -hmm. uh, really satisfied that itch. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to do an enormous amount of baseball uh, while I was studying Red. And, but also when I was doing, uh, playing in Oliver's uh, Any Given Sunday, I got to do a lot of football homework. And uh, so I, I've gotten to exercise that a little bit. Right. The problem at Syracuse was that all the underclassmen have to write copy for the for the upperclassmen, mm -hmm. as any journalism student to tell you, but you don't get to say it. Right. And I was like, no, if I'm writing it, I'm saying it. And right. they're like, no, you're not. And what it what it exposed would, was that all I really wanted to do was be a storyteller. Mm -hmm. There's a famous lore of actors is, you just say yes, you can do everything. So if they say, can you ah. ride a horse, you say yes, I can ride a horse. Have you ever done that? Have you ever said, yeah, I can do that, and then you had to, you felt like you had to scramble to make sure you could do that on the day? I was in a Broadway play called Requiem for a Heavyweight with Johnny Lithgow, and Johnny got nominated for an Emmy for it, and George Siegel and Davy Proval, and most of the character actors who would go on to play in The Sopranos, mm -hmm. all these great mm -hmm. Italian-American actors. And we opened, we did a three-month tryout out of town, tuned it up, and then we brought it to the Minskoff and we opened on a Thursday and closed on a Sunday. It was devastating. Right. My grandfather would subsequently die while we were on the road. And while we were on the road, my girlfriend broke up with me. So it was three, th three, three strikes. So the play closes on Sunday, Tuesday or Wednesday, the phone rings and the agent says, uh, Martin Bregman, who I knew because he produced all Al's movies, mm -hmm. I knew of him, says he wants to meet you for an Al and Alden movie. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sure. And so, I go in and meet Mr. Bregman, and you know, at the time he had a voice way back in here, and everything was um, um, very, very glorious in here. And so I read the script, and he goes, wonderful, wonderful. Come in Saturday and meet Alan. And I said, oh, Alan, now we're like the first day of racism <laughs> right. with the Alan. Right. And so I go in Saturday, and I meet Alan Alda, who was at the peak of his powers. Mm -hmm. it, it, MASH was a smash hit, mm -hmm. and blah, blah. And I read the script, I read the, the sides of the audition, and he says, great. We're going up to West Point tomorrow to look at a cannon, which as you know, when you read the script, you, you have to pull vault over it. Um, do, do you want to come up and take a look at it? And I'm like, are we presuming I'm in the movie? Are you offering me the, a movie? Am I getting my SAG card? And so he said, yes. And so I said, and you want me to drive up to West Point with you? And he said, yeah, we'll pick you up in the morning. I said, Ah, uh, okay. You're gonna pick me up. You're right. Alan Old. You're not gonna send some teamster and you know put me in a cab or something. Right. And he said, No, we'll come pick you up. Arlene and I, his wife. I'm like, Oh, Arlene. <laughs> sure. said, the whole gang's gonna be there. So, so now I'm an older. <laughs> so, Alan comes. I said, Well, I live in a funeral parlor. There's no door. There's no doorbell. I lived in a funeral parlor where Laguardia was born. Fiorello Laguardia. So it was a. The first two stories were dead people. <laughs> Three and four was where the guy lived, uh, who the proprietor, and then I lived with a roommate up on five. And I said, so, so there's no doorbell. So we just give me a shout, um, because I'm gonna probably go out with my friends and mm -hmm. get my SAG card. You're offering my SAG card here. And so I said, uh, he goes, okay, I'll come by. I'll, I'll give you a shout. I said, yeah, just a five-story walk up. Just give me a shout. <laughs> and so the next morning, Alan Ola is shouting on Sullivan Street, John, John McGinley, come on out. And so I, my roommate, Billy Githens, my dear friend, I go, Billy, Look out that window, and you tell me if that's not Alan Alda saying my name on Sullivan Street. You know, he looks out and says, that's Alan Alda. I'm like, I get in the limo. We're driving up to West Point. Arlene's here, lovely this woman, the history of the world. Alan Alda, one of my heroes. And I'm, um, 
going to West Point mm -hmm. to see a cannon that I'm to pole vault over. Yeah. I've never pole vaulted before. Um, and so I get up there and all the department heads are there for a big film for Universal, uh, Sweet Liberty. Mm -hmm. And with Michelle Pfeiffer and Michael Caine and Bob Hoskins, rest in peace, and all these great actors. It's and about a historical film being shot in a small town. Correct, yeah. exactly. And there are reenactors, mm -hmm. and I was gonna play one of the funny reenactors who in the context of the story takes a spontoon, which is a spear, which is what the Hessians did, and they vaulted over armored emplacements. Mm -hmm. So we get up there and I don't think you can carry me in the shot, but um, I've been to enough track meets where I saw four or five of these older gentlemen all um, standing there looking at me. And so I, I did what I've watched track meets my whole life. I, I went up to the cannon and I immediately did my steps backwards to measure my steps. Right. Then I got back there and I, I felt the weight of the, the pantomime to pole. And then I, I, I ran up to the pole and I, I ran up to the cannon. And I said, that's yeah, gonna be great. <laughs> it's gonna be fantastic. <laughs> They're all looking at me like, really? And I said, yeah, I mean, it's only it's like a seven foot cannon. Yeah, it's just um, my height, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, <laughs> I called my friend Marty McHugh, who was a great pole vaulter in high school out in Jersey where I, I went to high school and he said, Marty, uh, Can you tell we, me over the phone? We have a situation. No, but I had seven weeks. Right. Oh, so seven weeks. I could learn how to do dental surgery there we in seven go. weeks. <laughs> the only catch here was that a cannon, unlike uh, a bar in a, in a pole vaulting competition, that'll mm -hmm. move. The cannon's not moving. Mm -hmm. So you have to get that out of your head. So Marty stacked these Rubbermaid garbage cans to a certain height, and we learned how to, he taught me how to pole vault over it. So on the day, uh, Three months later, out in uh, Sag Harbor in Long Island, uh, there are four or five hundred extras behind me. There's a cannon over there. I have my spontoon. I've done my steps. I put a plant box in front of the uh, in front of the cannon, and I'm to 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 go over it. Land on Frankie Ferrara, who was the stunt man, who was an enormous man. Bounce off of him, and then they buried a mattress underneath the cannon. And we did it, rehearsed it a few times. It was perfect. Mm -hmm. Alan calls action. I go, bump, bump, bump. I hit the plant box. I go over. I bank so I bank off Frankie Ferrara. I land on the thing. Perfect. You know, 400 people are screaming behind me, and so I get my pole. I dust my cut, cut myself off. I go back to my steps, and I see everybody kind of walking away. And I was like, Oh, I know what you Hollywood people do now. This is where I get my close up. This is it's Johnny C time. <laughs> and so Alan Alda comes over to me with a bullhorn, and. Uh, the sun was going behind the trees, and as you know, when there's, you're losing the light, mm -hmm. the, the day's over. There's a huge exterior. Mm -hmm. and so he came over and he said, Duh, we, we got it. All five cameras. There was a camera up in that, in that what, do you, what do you call it, crane. Mm -hmm. There was an apple bird in the, the a, a, a camera in the, in the ground. Um, we had one over your shoulder. We, it was miraculous. We got it. Plus, the, the sun's going down. Mm -hmm. and I said, oh, I'd like another. I think it get a lot, a lot higher. I rode the pole that time. I can get some separation from the pole. And he said, uh, oh, guy, he's such a mensch. I'll start crying, telling the story. He's like, um, you didn't know how to pole, did you? I said, no, Alan, I didn't. I couldn't lie anymore. Don't kid a kidder. And I said, no, I didn't. He goes, I knew you could. I just wanted you in the movie. See that guy over there? See that guy dressed the same? That's called your double. He's a stuntman. He can he can pull both fifteen. If you couldn't do it, we we're gonna get him. And he said, "I love you more than my father." And so yes, I've said that I can do things that I was afraid I couldn't, but it worked out. I want to talk to you about Scrubs. Scrubs was like a little show that could sure. like. It's what a crazy, what a crazy journey that show went on. Started off on, uh, did it start off on NBC? Yes. Then went to ABC? Yes. Then ended up at uh, Comedy Central, no, right? ABC was the end of ABC it. It was, was the NBC end of it? for eight years. But it made it to syndication on ABC and then started running on Comedy Central seemingly around the clock. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but when the show came out, we were lucky enough to get on behind the the waning years of Friends, mm -hmm. which when people used to not surf as much as we do, you know, I think the understanding was once you put it on NBC's comedy block, you were gonna just stay there. Yeah. We don't know in 2014 if people necessarily do that. Um, I think we switch around quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But it was back when people, we'd just stay on that network. And so we got to follow Friends. So 
you get to make a little bit of a beachhead. Mm -hmm. And then we got to follow Frasier. And so for the first four years, that was our lead in. And that served the show really well. So by year five, the show was a, a quasi hit, mm -hmm. not a top 10 hit, but enough to allow the show to be picked up for a couple years. And, and the fans of the show were very devoted. It was like before, uh, you know, uh, Community, which has, you know, is famous for having yes. such a rabid fan base. I remember Scrubs at the time was like, people who loved Scrubs really loved Scrubs. Absolutely. People would proselytize about it. You know, they, they were very, they were very excited about Scrubs. So there, that period where NBC says no more, uh, how long of a wait was it before you got word that another network was going to pick it up? It's funny. It was right at the uh, the depth of that recession, <laughs> of the, the last recession we yeah. had. And the show had been canceled on NBC. And uh, Billy Lawrence came out to my house, and Bill Lawrence is the creator of Scrubs mm -hmm. and Ground Floor. And he said, ABC's picking the show up. You'll get the same amount of dough you got for year eight if you position or or try to get more money you're out two other of the ensemble tried it and they were out right uh and that was that was hard medicine mm -hmm. and so he said we're probably going to do about 17 or 18 episodes i'll have you wrapped it was july-ish i'll have you wrapped right around christmas you can move on and do any flick you want if something comes up and you need to be light that week i'll write you light but uh this is a chance for the whole cast and crew to get through another season. If one of the young kids pops, you know, we, we relocated to a medical school mm -hmm. and added four new principals. And if one of those kids had been Robin Williams-esque in Mork and Mindy, the show would still be on. Yeah. But Robin Williams-esque on Mork and Mindy doesn't exist. That's a, a phenomenon. Yeah. But th th that, those were the stakes. <laughs> and so we got another year out of it and it was, it was heaven. Mm -hmm. It was heaven. I, you know, Dr. Cox, look, writers can really excel at writing damaged characters. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the leading man does X, Y, and Z. He gets the girl, he falls in love, he saves the day. That's what he does. Mm -hmm. the, the best friend and coworker or teacher who's uh, a closet alcoholic, who's been divorced, who hates himself, um, who loves his students but uh, can't suffer mediocrity, they can write that char character uh, infinitely without making him an exercise in redundancy because of his damages. Mm -hmm. That's who Dr. Cox was. So they got to just keep peeling the layers back of this guy. And every week, uh, it was an adventure. Mm -hmm. I think it's a disconnect for some people when they hear something that, uh, like, that playing Dr. Cox for you was as uh, gratifying, as rewarding as any Oliver Stone drama that you have done. Like to you, the approach is the same. It's here's the character, here's the text, here's what I'm gonna do. Here are the verbs. Yeah. But also at Dr. Cox, you got to do 182 times over nine years. And it, if you didn't get that out of your system, um, what were you waiting for? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> For an actor, the, the allure of television can be, it gives you some sense of regularity to your life, of like, I go here every day, 100%. I do this, I know the people are gonna be the same, you know. Um, but there's also the idea of you get to not stop playing a character. You get to continue that life, which can be a very rich and rewarding experience. Um, I are read you once where John Malkovich, uh, in, in some interview or another, said, and there was no arrogance to this, he said there, that he felt like there was two different schools of approaching characters and, and, and how he um, started to take on a script. Mm -hmm. And he said there was the Robert De Niro version, which was to try to get into the character and make all the sacrifices that Bob's made over the years. And, and John said, or there's a way I do it, and I let the character become me. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, John Malkovich, know me better than I'm ever going to know anything about who, who this and that person is. And I, I'm from John's school. Mm -hmm. And so I let Dr. Cox become me. Mm -hmm. And I added some kind of some strange rhythms to his sound and stuff, but not that different. Basically, you're, the actor's job is to interpret the character for the audience. You're, you're delivering who this person is to the audience via the words on the page. Absolutely. And so... Um, it's just a different kind of interpretation, essentially. Yes. Yeah. Now you're on uh, Ground Floor on TBS. Uh, this is the 
you just started your second season? Yes. Um, tell me about your character on Ground Floor, because it is somewhat different than uh, Dr. Cox on Scrubs. Oh, I, I made a pretty conscious effort to make him different. Yeah. Uh, because in some circles, at the risk of sounding arrogant, uh, Cox is uh, a, a little bit of a, a, a famous kind of character. And yeah. so you want to get away from that because the actor wants to do something else. And it's also by virtue of the way television works, that character is still out there. Correct. Yeah. So I'm coming off Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross on Broadway with Al Pacino two years ago, like right now. Mm -hmm. And it was the most exciting thing I ever did in my life. Mm -hmm. And with Bobby Cannavale and Richard Schiff and all these terrific actors. And we had an incredible run. And it was everything, it was bucket list. Mm -hmm. Bill Lawrence comes to the show one night and he says, when you guys rap in the end of February, um, let's talk because I have a pilot that I think is just right for you. And I'm like, Billy, thanks to you, creatively and financially, I'm good. My cup is full television wise. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just, I'm in this Glen Gary thing and this is kind of a whole new adventure. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, but just can we talk? And so come February I did, cause I love Billy. And he goes, I want you to have complete creative autonomy coming up with this guy. Well, there's a little bait on the hook that any actor is going to bite. Yeah, which, because that's not a thing. And Billy you never, never lies. Hear that. And Billy never lies. Right. Ever. Ever. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I bit. And <laughs> uh, and it, it happened in conjunction right when Daniel Day Lewis was doing all that press for Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's no recorded sound of Lincoln's voice. And the first thing Daniel said on some interview was that he really was obsessed with finding Lincoln's sound. Mm -hmm. And I thought, same here. I want to find Mansfield, the character Mansfield, who, who's in Ground Floor. I want to find his sound. And so I thought it was a perfect launching point to, to explore th three of the, the, the people who really impacted me. And it's George Scott, George C. Scott, mm -hmm. um, and Lee J. Cobb, mm -hmm. and my father. And all of their sounds are way in the back. Mm -hmm. and, and like George Scott in, in, uh, in, in Strange Love. <laughs> you know, when everything's in here. Yeah. And I wanted to see what that was. And so, and then, and I, I visited Lee J. Cobb and on the waterfront when he, when he's telling Terry, you know, telling Brando, Malloy, you don't work coming down the Eastern <laughs> Seaboard. <laughs> and I wanted to go in there a little bit. And so, and they take it back with my father who, who, who you know, sometimes um, he, he takes a second for it to, <laughs> for it to come out. <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, there. There, that's who Mansfield's gonna be. <laughs> Ground Floor is on TBS. Uh, on Tuesday nights. On Tuesday nights. Uh, John C. McGinley, what a pleasure to chat with you. Vice versa. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us on. Absolutely. That is it for this round of Speakeasy. Please join me again next time when my guest will be a different person. What is the name of that Norman Lambert? I can't remember. I just saw him plugging it on something. It's a horrible title. <laughs> because I can't remember, it's a horrible title. You know, it takes a while for you to realize that no one is really telling you that your film is great. Yeah. And now, that, and after we made that first film that went to Sundance, it was the opposite. Like everybody was like, they didn't even tell us what it was great. They were like, oh my God, what is that? You could feel it. You what could, you could yeah. feel it. It's just in the energy.